Well, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for being here. What a great crowd we have this evening. I'm Gretchen Sawyer. I'm the Executive Director of the Foundation and Grants Office, and I assist the President with some special projects. So thank you for joining us this evening to hear from the founder of the Distinguished Speaker Series herself, Diane Cheseldine. <laughs> We have a wonderful crowd here this evening, including community members and TMCC faculty and staff. And I want to recognize our Vice President of Academic Affairs, Dr. Jeffrey Alexander, who's over there in the back. We also have with us the President of Western Nevada College, Kyle Delpy, is joining us this evening as well. Thank you. Lots of faculty and directors here, and we so appreciate you being here this evening. This all shows how revered Diane is. <laughs> Shortly, Diane is going to take us on her journey of bringing the world to Reno for the past 22 years. You will note in your program a listing of the impressive speakers that Diane has brought to Reno and to TMCC, starting with the inaugural speaker, Michael, I'm sorry, Malcolm Miller in the year 2000. Diane has not only brought more than 30 prominent speakers to camp campus, she also had an amazing career at the college. She taught French, Spanish, and courses in the humanities for 29 years. <laughs> yes. And we are honored that she continues to teach the course that she developed during her 1998 sabbatical from Spain to New, to New Mexico. That's the name of her course that she teaches once per year. So without further ado, please welcome my friend and connector to amazing people, Diane. <laughs> My goodness, I know it's a chilly evening out there. I can't thank you enough for coming this evening. It's cold outside, but my heart is warm. So I can't thank you enough, dear friends and colleagues, uh, for joining me this evening. It means so much to me, and I'm just delighted to see everybody. And uh, so I hope uh, this evening that we can share some fun stories. So, so thank you. And thank you for that lovely uh, introduction, Gretchen. Yes, yeah. And Gretchen and I are becoming better acquainted. I know she was in France recently, and so I've been trying to get her into a French class, but <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> I uh, want to um, thank uh, the new, newly formed committee uh, so that our series will be continuing. And uh, this is uh, just uh, wonderful to know. It's just in the best hands possible. And you've probably seen the new coordinator, oh, right over here, running around. And uh, uh, it's just uh, really wonderful um, that we'll be continuing. And um, I just hope they'll let me uh, lurk around and um, maybe go to the airport for some <laughs> interesting people and have a few parties, if you'll let me. If you'll let me. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, and I would do, do want to acknowledge, uh, we have two of our local past speakers with us this evening. We have Dr. Louis Fourline from the Anthropology Anthropology Department at UNR, and he did a Zoom for us during the pandemic. And so, so, and uh, I'm sure he'd be happy to talk to you about his work in Brazil. And we also have 
Dr. Daryl Lockhart, who spoke a few years ago. He's with the Spanish Department at UNR also. So thank you very much for coming up the hill from the other institution. <laughs> Somos amigos, no? <laughs> Uh, I don't, uh, I have a very dear friend that goes back to when I first uh, came to Reno. Um, I don't see her, uh, perhaps she'll, she will be here, but um, she was one of the first professors at TMCC, started instead, if you, many of you know that the college started there, and uh, when this wonderful uh, invitation came up, she asked me what I would like to uh, convey to you this evening or to think about. And um, so she, um, I did spend time thinking about her question. And I believe <coughs> for me and the opportunities that I've been fortunate to have and to travel, I feel that uh, what is of importance to me and I probably for many of you, I hope so, is to experience that human connection in our travels. It's, I think it's that heart-to-heart -heart connection that uh, can help us increase our understanding of each other across the globe and to hopefully rise above uh, our fears and perhaps judgments. And uh, that's what I, I, I hope to continue on that journey myself. And I know many of you are travelers, and if, if um, you haven't been doing a lot recently, we have the director of deluxe tr travel right here in the second <laughs> row. Okay, Jose, <laughs> how am I doing? Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay. I have an appointment with you, don't I, tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, I thought so. All right. All right. <laughs> I, uh, next, it's, uh, this is a wonderful uh, opportunity I think I've been craving for a long time, and that is to express my gratitude to my beloved parents, Tom and Laura Cheseldine. Um, it was, uh, I would have had a wonderful life anyway, growing up with them, but in 1958, my father was teaching at Oklahoma State University, and uh, I remember vividly the day he came home, opened the door excitedly and said, do you want to go to Ethiopia? And I think my mother and I, maybe it was 30 seconds before <laughs> responding that, of course we want to go to Ethiopia. Uh, so it was that decision that really um, started me on the path of curiosity about other cultures and other peoples. So that was um, the beginning. In the first slide, you saw my father, and then I dig, did dig up my first passport. <laughs> so that, that was fun. And a uh, few people uh, and the audience have said, oh, wow, I wish I kept my first passport. So <laughs> keep your scrapbooks around. <laughs> you never know when you'll be at this podium. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then the next slide on our uh, first stop on the way to Ethiopia was in uh, Cairo. And so you can imagine leaving a, uh, northern Oklahoma, and next thing I know, we're sitting atop snorting camels my father elegantly dressed as, of course, in those years, it was different. Uh, uh, when we traveled, people dressed up, dressed up and holding his pipe. He was rarely without his pipe. And then my mother and uh, I beaming from ear to ear. And uh, I'll be talking shortly about Dr. Hawass, the Egyptologist. And when he spoke here, I showed him, I was anxious to show him this picture. And he said, oh, Diane, you can't even be in this spot anymore to have your picture taken. Uh, you know, different places, but it's, everything has changed. So he loved uh, this particular angle that the photograph was taken in. Uh, 
So uh, when we uh, departed, my parents were in their 30s. I was 13, and when we started our new life. And uh, these are, uh, were taken on the campus of what is now the second oldest university in Ethiopia, Haramaya University. And the uh, emperor of Ethiopia at that time, Haile Selassie, uh, would uh, at times uh, visit the campus. And so my mother, uh, this is a shot of my mother shaking the hand of uh, the king of kings, the reigning lion of Judah, Haile Selassie, probably the last actual emperor king, I believe. And, um, and on the right, it just uh, this was actually in the front of our house. And um, <clears throat> so uh, shots of uh, life, or beginning our life. Uh, I was very uh, fortunate to have a diverse educational, educational experiences, and when we lived in a, the t a town, it's now the second largest city in Ethiopia, but uh, I was homeschooled for t the first two years, but um, there was a local uh, French school because um, there were quite a few French people in Ethiopia because the um, the train, uh, which still goes, I believe, from the Red Sea to Addis Ababa, the, the capital would pass through Dawa. So I would, uh, they allowed me to go take this gadi or horse uh, carriage to the uh, lo local French school, and I would sit in the back just listening to the um, nuns speak, giving the lessons to the other students, and then after a few months, I walked out, and I could. I was uh, made a lot of progress in, in understanding the language. So I was lucky to start the language that way, because I know as a teacher, you know, day one, it's like, all right, the verb être is conjugated this way, and they're all like, oh, I think I, I think I've taken too many classes. I need to drop this class. But so I was lucky. I just listened. Um, so I would go to the school with uh, the next door, neighbors, their daughter Trudy, they were from German, and uh, we would take the Gotti um, to school. Uh, after the two years of homeschooling, I um, my parents returned to Ethiopia, and um, I uh, they uh, I don't know quite how. They uh, learned of a British boarding school outside of Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, I was able to go there. It was a Church of England school, so it was on that schedule. So I could return to Ethiopia for a break uh, every three months. And um, so I was there for two years, played a little field hockey, hard to believe now. And I even had a British accent, <laughs> mixture, American slash British, I think. <laughs> Uh, that's long gone, I think. Um, I was there for two years, and my parents returned to Ethiopia, and I uh, had been, you know, uh, learning French, so I was uh, in a Swiss boarding school uh, near Lausanne, Switzerland, on Lake Geneva for two years, so I worked on the French. And they returned to Ethiopia, they loved their life, and uh, it's time for college, so I became a student at uh, what is now the American University of Paris. At the time I was a student in the third graduating class, it was a two-year institution, it was the American College of Paris. But subsequently, it, it now offers master's degrees, and uh, uh, we had classes in the basement of the American church in Paris, now it's very uh, fancy do. But uh, I was there for a six-year reunion this summer, and it was really just made me so grateful that I had that opportunity to begin the love affair with Paris. And many of you probably may have that those feelings and are familiar with the saying, Paris is always a good idea. <laughs> and uh, at the... Um, end of uh, when I, so I also hold an AA degree from the American College in Paris. And then my parents returned to Ethiopia. I needed to return to the United States. And I chose uh, for several reasons. One uh, reason, I had a friend that I had known from Ethiopia at the University of Colorado. So I uh, started my junior year at the University of Colorado. I felt 
uh, I can relate to international students because uh, I myself have been out of the country for eight years, so um, you know I had to uh, kind of relearn to to, to be uh, over here in the in the United States. Uh, it was a hard time for me when my father died unexpectedly six months after I'd returned of pneumonia in Ethiopia. So I was grateful that my friend Effie was there to be with me, and she had known my parents, of course, um, and that uh, necess necessitated that my mother return, and she returned to Oklahoma because we were from Oklahoma, and my grandmother was there. So after I graduated from the University of uh, Colorado with my bachelor's degree, I returned to Oklahoma, started a master's uh, at the University of Oklahoma, and I'm grateful I was uh, fortunate to um, be near my mother until her death. So, um, let's see. so I, uh, I'd like to play just a very short recording of a dear friend of mine who is in Austin who wasn't able to uh, come this evening, but his parents were also in Ethiopia. And um, we had seen each other off and on over the years. There used to be reunions in Oklahoma for uh, the people who had been in that program in Ethiopia. And uh, I asked him to sit, so he was our neighbor, and we've reunited. He's uh, actually writing a book, a uh, fiction uh, set in Ethiopia, and I'm trying to write some stories myself. So he couldn't come, and so I'd like to play my friend Jeff's short recording. Congratulations to Truckee Meadows Community College on this occasion of dedicating the Diane Dodd Chesseldean Distinguished Lecture Series. And a hearty congratulations to Diane for almost a quarter century of the Distinguished Lecture Series at Truckee Meadows. Uh, any university or college in America would really covet and be proud of this lecture series that's been established. And so we're uh, really, really, really happy to be here today to celebrate this milestone. I knew Diane back in the 1960s. Her father, Tom Chesseldine, was teaching English at Heidi Selassie First College of Agriculture. Her mother, the bookkeeper, accountant. And uh, my father was teaching, we lived right next door to the Chesseldines. As a, a young man in middle school, it was particularly exciting to see a teenage girl coming in from boarding school to visit. And that was Diane. She was attending in Kenya and in Europe. And so our paths had that ability to cross back in the 1960s. And most recently, we've had a chance to get back together and talk about our memories and to memorialize in writing a lot of those wonderful Ethiopian stories. So it's a great honor to be able to be invited today to say a hearty congratulations to Diane for her vision, for her leadership, for her willingness to go forward with a great idea and that is to invite different voices to the university campus through the Distinguished Lecture Series. A hearty congratulations to Truckee Meadows Community College on this occasion. A warm, warm congratulations to my dear friend Diane, and God bless you all on the next 25 years of the Truckee Meadows Community College Lecture Series. Did you hear that, Tommy, the next 25 years? <laughs> All right, I just want to make sure you got that part. Um, I mentioned that at the University of Colorado, I had a friend, and here we are. Uh, this is my friend Effie. You'll hear from her next. And uh, first person I met in Ethiopia when I got off the plane, and we somehow didn't lose each other. She ended up uh, in the United States and is... Uh, has lived in Missoula, with, been with the University of Montana for years, and this is a shot of us. We returned together in uh, 20, um, 2005. I'd been kind of scared to go back all those years, especially because my father 
past there, but I was it was safe to go with Effie and her um, siblings because we'd all been there together. So we've uh, tried to get together once once a year at least, and uh, we'll be traveling soon to Morocco again. So um, she was unable to be here tonight, but she has a few words. So this is Effie. My name is Effie Kern, and I am a longtime friend of Diane. Sorry, I could not be present at today's event to give my in-person testimony of our friendship. I first met Diane when we were both 13 years old, and <clears throat> Diane had come with her parents to Dirigal, Ethiopia, my hometown, and I was the one who welcomed her at the airport. We kept in touch for the past <clears throat> 60 years. And at some point, we were also graduate students together at the University of Colorado. When Diane moved to Reno and I settled in Missoula, Montana, our adventurous selves rekindled with many trips together to many places in the US, in Europe, Africa, New Zealand, among others. Diane is a person who captivates the hearts of everyone she encounters through her generosity and spirit, making friends everywhere she goes. It is those qualities that have made the Distinguished Lecture Series such a success at Truckee Meadows Community College by bringing exceptional speakers. My warm congratulations to Diane and to the members of the Distinguished I did read, oh, I'd mentioned I went back with uh, Effie in 2005. Uh, in 2014, I went back to kind of uh, go back to our houses, start thinking and preparing uh, to do uh, some writing myself, uh, a memoir. And uh, a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, thing that happened is I was able to um, reconnect with the man on the right who had been our gardener in the 60s. Of course, he was a teenager then. And I stayed on the campus uh, where my, we had lived. And, he, and many of you know in different countries, you know, the word gets out. And uh, I was standing outside the, the dormitory and this older man came up and, you know, was kind of uh, putting his arms around me and he said, Daniel, Daniel, Daniel. And I thought, Daniel, who's Daniel? Who's this person? And then I remembered that he could never say my name. He always called me Daniel. <laughs> uh, so he, he heard, heard and he came and, uh, you know, we embraced for the longest time and then we sat down finally to talk and he still didn't know English very well, but he opened his wallet and pulled out my father's photo he, he'd kept with him in his wallet for since 1967. So, Sally. So that was um, such a wonderful experience. And then he reminded me, so the, on the left is a picture of my mother uh, with the trees that she planted with Solly's help. And to this day, you now this since uh, he would walk up the hill, you know, every week to check on my mother's trees. So I said, I'll be back and we'll walk up that hill together. So that was, that was wonderful. Uh, on my return trip also, I, um, uh, I had helped a young man go to university uh, that I'd met back in 2005, and when I went back in 2014, I was able to uh, see him. He's in the city of Lalibela. You, some of you may have heard of the underground churches in Lalibela, and uh, I, I'd helped him also buy a copy machine. And so we took the little, arrived, and we took the taxi, uh, the Gotti, right? And uh, I got off and I looked up and I, I now have a copy shop in Lalibela. <laughs> and it, now I'm remembering in the first painting, if you don't mind going back, Eddie, thank you. He is spelled shop as shoop. 
And I, to this day, I regret correcting the spelling because <laughs> I think it would be cool just to have a shoop. <laughs> and then I was telling that story in Addis when I got back to some uh, characters, uh, and they said there's an old song, of something about the shoop. I don't know if it's British or something. I don't know if anybody knows that, but uh, anyway, I have a shoop or a shop. <laughs> Probably doesn't exist now because there have been a lot of troubles, you know, in Ethiopia the last two years. But I'm still in connection with, with Talak, and he calls me to this day. Uh, let's see here. I will uh, move ahead a little bit and uh, to what brought me to uh, Reno and Truckee Meadows Community College. Um, <laughs> Am I missing something? Uh, what? Oh, uh, how'd you know? Let me tell the story, please. All right, uh, just uh, slowly, slowly, huh? Uh, after my mother passed, I really um, uh, wanted to start a different life, a new life, and I had a cousin. Uh, living in Reno, and I had visited him a few times, and I had loved the landscape and uh, the mountains, Ethiopia's mountainous, and um, and uh, he in invited me in 1986 to a concert by Julio Iglesias. And so I had visited him before, as I said, and um, I thought, well, and I knew there's a community college here. And so I said, of course I'll be there. And so I was managed to get an, an appointment for an interview, grab my resume, and um, came up the hill as you did tonight. And I remember that interview. And um, by, lo and behold, I was offered a part-time position teaching French. So I got on the plane to come back. And you know, it was scary to ex take a part-time position. But I thought, <laughs> You know, this is an opportunity. Hopefully, being on site would be helpful. And um, I had my cousin to hear, and uh, I could stay with him. And his daughter's uh, with me tonight. He has passed, but his dear daughter is now my uh, my new cousin. <laughs> we didn't grow up together, but uh, I love her, and so um, I um, thank. Uh, your dad, and Julio Iglesias for being here. <laughs> <sighs> That's the story you were talking about, Shirley, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, the part-time position, I was fortunate, uh, three or four years after I started in 86, um, uh, I uh, the first position, a full-time uh, foreign language position was opened here at the college, and I was able to get that position, and uh, that was uh, wonderful. I'm grateful for that. So I just um, uh, tell a couple of student stories, and uh, I have a, uh, you can see a, a spider pin I got in New Mexico, and I, every once in a while I would wear that, and uh, Every time I would wear it, the same thing would happen. Half the class would I walk in and say, oh, what is that spider on you? Oh, that's disgusting. The other half, oh, that's so cool. We love that spider. And there was a student in a class, and he, he needed to fulfill an art project, photography, and do a, a photo. So we did this photo in, in the class. So I, I hope he got a good grade. <laughs> <clears throat> and um, let's see here. Following that, um, I have uh, uh, I've been fortunate. I think it's a wonderful part of being at the community college. We have an op opportunity to, see, to become friends with, with our students. And uh, the next uh, video is of a dear friend of mine who was one of my first students, and. Uh, she was not unable to attend tonight. She's in Colorado. And uh, so I just, she has kindly offered to say a few words.
Hello, my name is Deborah Parisi, and I'm honored to say a few words about Ms. Cheseldine, my first college professor in my very first college class. I can still hear the pitter patter of her shoes coming down the hallway into the class that first day. And after a student asked her to write her credentials on the chalkboard, all of us were aware that we were in the presence of a very unique individual. And that dedicated and passionate teacher became a dear friend. And 35 years later, I'm proud to honor her tonight. I still wanted to be there in person, but my husband and I had planned a trip to Costa Rica. So I hope that this message from our home in Colorado will communicate how I cherish her and our friendship. Diane is so capable in so many areas. I remember the excitement in her voice as she told me that Philippe, grandson to Jacques Cousteau, would be speaking at her lecture series. And tonight, we honor Diane by renaming that lecture series the Diane Dodd Cheseldine Distinguished Speaker Series. Diane's also a talented photographer. This picture taken by Diane is a cherished gift. And for those of you who have been to her house, you'll agree that stepping into Diane's home is like stepping into an exotic worldly experience. Her home is a testament to her international travel. The night before our first child was born, we were there with family and friends, and we still think our son's labor was induced by all of us playing Diane's African drums. <laughs> so dear Diane, much love and hugs from far away. I'm so sorry we couldn't be there, but please know we're honored to be your friends. Enjoy the celebration. We can't think of anyone more deserving. We love you. Now let's start talking about the series. <laughs> um, I think it was mentioned before, I had a sabbatical in 1998-99, and uh, I, uh, it was my project. I had been teaching Spanish, and uh, I get, became interested in the Camino de Santiago. Maybe many of you, I'm sure, know a little bit about that medieval pilgrimage route. And I thought, well, I uh, got interested. I'll do research on that. I became interested in the the uh, Moorish architecture and all these neat things. So I spent uh, eight months in uh, Spain and, and about a month in France. And I had heard about a noted British historian who had lived next to Chartres Cathedral. It's about an hour south of Paris. And he'd spoken on BBC. He had been knighted. And uh, I thought, well, you know, I, I better hear this guy, this British gentleman. And uh, so I arranged the um, uh, tour time. And um, at the very end, uh, we were standing out on the steps at the portico of the cathedral, and he huffed up, and he was so proud, and he said, I've been to every state in, in the United States except for Nevada. And I don't know which spirit came over me, but I just followed him into the cathedral. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there were lots of people, but somehow I didn't lose, because lose, uh, he was a tall guy with long legs, but somehow I uh, got up with him. And I said, well, um, I'm with the university system in Nevada, uh, and would you speak at my college? And he said... But of course. <laughs> so he had, gave me his card with fax number, and off he went. And I went back to the hotel. And when I came back to Reno, and we started communicating only through faxes. He was old-fashioned guy. I think we had computers then, right? And he didn't do emails. So we did all that by fax. and. Um, and so he came, and that's in 2000, and uh, got off the plane, I remember, and, and bent over and touched the ground. He was so happy to, to complete uh, his um, 
bucket list, maybe. <laughs> uh, and um, it was a wonderful presentation. And uh, I, I recently Googled him, and by golly, he's, he's, well, he's 87, and he's still giving tours of the cathedral. And uh, I remember I, he was interviewed recently in, in another state here, and he compared the cathedral to a library because Chartres is the best preser preserved Gothic cathedral in Europe. Somehow it survived the uh, atrocities of wars through, through his, throughout history, and so it's almost, almost perfectly intact. So he said it's like having a medieval manuscript that's only missing a couple of pages, whereas many of them, you know, were uh, uh, damaged heavily. And so, uh, if you, everybody, I'm going to bring attention to my san friend Sandy in the front row. This is Sandy, and she helped me uh, uh, at that time, and this is Malcolm's book. Sir Malcolm, he was knighted by the Queen. So, I, please, if anybody is going to France to Chartres, you have to take his tour, and you just give him lots of greetings. So, <laughs> it was wonderful. He's still doing it. I think the slide showed his hair had perhaps lightened a little bit. <gasps> um, okay, does anybody uh, remember Jacques Cousteau? <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I decided to try and learn a little bit about, not learn, about, uh, have a snorkeling experience. And I, um, in 2002, I got a group organized a trip to the Dutch island of Bonaire in uh, the Caribbean, and um, was coming. You know, we were coming out of the water one day, and people were uh, talking about a noted person staying in the hotel. And I thought, I wonder who that is. So I found out it was Philippe Cousteau, grandson of the oceanographer Jacques Cousteau. So I got in line with with everybody else and to get his autograph and say bonjour. And uh, when I got up to him, it's just I got the bonjour out, but then it was like, would you like to speak at my college? <laughs> and his answer was, mais bien sûr, of course. <laughs> and uh, so uh, very uh, lovely young man. He was only 22 at the time. And he, his, he just gave a wonderful presentation, but you know, he was raised in the Cousteau family. And um, so uh, that was a wonderful experience. And I, I uh, well, anyway, maybe I shouldn't get too gossipy, but I think that Jacques, the grandfather, had married an airline hostess, an American, and then there were between French and American law, you know, who gets the Calypso boat. And he said, if anybody calls you and asks you if you know Philippe Cousteau, you say, no. <laughs> Nobody called. So um, I hope I'd like to show our guests a little bit of the area. Uh, so uh, my dear friend who's sitting right here in the front row, Shirley Nelson, uh, my friend from uh, UNR, the French department, uh, was living at Tahoe, and she invited a small group of us to uh, actually to spend the night in their home. So we went up to Tahoe and had a wonderful evening. Shirley had a new puppy. I think it was right before uh, this photo. And Philippe loved the puppy. We stayed up late, laughing, talking. He was so nice. He insisted on flying here, I think from Florida, uh, on uh, economy class. He wouldn't go first class or anything. Lovely young man. So we stayed at Tahoe. And then um, I have another dear friend in the front row, the one who's helped with Malcolm Miller, uh, was doing her PhD work on uh, the um, air, uh, water quality of Tahoe, and she arranged for us to go out on the research vessel. I think it's shared by um, um, UNR and UC Davis, uh, so that he could see uh, how the research was done. Is that correct, Sandy? Am I doing OK? OK, thank you. I mean, you're welcome to come up here and get into details if you like. Uh, so this is a shot of Philippe on the boat. And of course, I was excited to invite everybody to go on the boat with Philippe Cousteau, but I forgot to keep count. 
of who I invited. So everybody wanted to show up, right, to go on the boat. So uh, and the boat was, yeah, I don't know, a little bit bigger than this podium, right? But uh, And everybody showed up, and I thought, oh, this is not good. The boat is going to sink. But somehow we fit everybody in. And I think some other people were here. I think, Virginia, weren't you on the boat? Yeah. And it was crowded, though, right? Yeah. And so fortunately, uh, we didn't sink and Philippe sink with us, and uh, so that was just a, 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 love, a wonderful experience, and um, it was so kind of him, him to come at that time. Now he has his own uh, environmental uh, organization, I think it's called Earth Echo, out of Washington or Florida, and is doing very well, and, uh, but he was only 22. He was lovely. So thank you for having us, uh, Shirley, at your home, and for arranging that uh, next is uh, I would like to speak to someone who is very dear to my heart uh, as a friend, as a friend, and is also uh, someone who helps so much with the series. Um, and this is my friend Dee Gamal, and um, Dee uh, was married with an Egyptian diplomat. I don't know how they ended up in uh, Reno, maybe tax purposes. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> But she and her husband uh, ended up my French class. He had a uh, law, he had international law degree from France, and he wanted to brush up on his French. So um, found out that uh, she was from Oklahoma, so we had that in common. And because she was married with an Egyptian, uh, she spent part of each year in Cairo. And uh, she always called, considered Cairo to be the gateway to Africa. So, you know, we love Africa. So bless her heart, on one of her uh, tr stays uh, back in Cairo, uh, she got an appointment with Dr. Zahi Hawass, and many of you, uh, the uh, famed Egyptologist, and many of you have probably seen him on Discovery over the years. And um, so she arranged that. I don't know what she, how she did it, but she did it. And then she turned the arrangements over to me. And uh, Dr. Owas came, and uh, that presentation was in the student center. And um, people were hanging from the rafters, as in the cafeteria rafters. And uh, uh, it was a wonderful presentation. And uh, uh, if you don't mind that past one, I just want to say that um, the young the little boy is my godson, and his mother and his grandmother are here tonight. And and uh, um, Virginia, the grandmother, was kind enough to dress him as King Tut. <laughs> and then uh, we had another young lady as uh, dressed as uh, Cleopatra, and they were so good. They stayed on the quietly on the stage while Dr. Hawass spoke. So now Cody's all grown up and graduated from college, but uh, love to see this photograph. And Dr. Hawass is very kind to visit uh, classes as well. Uh, and uh, you can see, you see he, in magazines, um, he's, he's, like Sir Malcolm, he's still at it, and he takes uh, tours, and he, of course, has exclusive, um, uh, what I say, uh, access to the Sphinx. So it's a very uh, top-notch uh, tour, if any of you are interested in doing that. But he, you see him in the magazines. Um, and uh, when we were going to have the 20-year celebration almost three years ago, uh, I contacted him, and he said a few words then. So this is what he put together uh, about two and a half years ago from Cairo. I'm happy the end that you are celebrating now uh, 20 years for this lecture series. And I remember when I came and I talked to, to the students, I told them about my passion. And also with Mrs. Sadat, I remember the great event that you organized. I hope that you uh, will continue this great work. As you know that uh, we are going to open the Grand Museum this coming October. I hope all of you can come and visit us, and I do support you to continue this great uh, lecture series uh, to teach the people in Reno about different cultures. Thank you, always. Yeah, was that nice? Lovely. Yeah, yeah. 
And uh, of all things, oh, so after he was here, and then Dee uh, had invited me uh, to go to Cairo, since she had her uh, her uh, lived there part of the year. And I said, I, I don't know the meaning of the word no now, in case you that doesn't surprise you. Uh, so I went, and then D, uh, we wanted to go on an outing downtown Cairo to a nice hotel and have an afternoon. And um, I think we went to the Hilton Hotel. And um, I checked the uh, population then in, in uh, what did I say, 2000. Now I've lost track uh, uh, about 12 years ago or so. Anyway, Cairo at that time was 20 million. Now it's much, much more course and uh, we found a place where should we sit to watch the people and we found a little like a mezzanine we went up there we ordered our tea and baklava and we were visiting and then talking and having tea and uh, there was heavy even security at that time watching the fascinating people coming into the lobby I happened to look up Dr. Walsh walks in out of 20 million places in the hotel where we were having tea. Now, how is that? So I saw him, and so I probably had you know, my fork here with the baklava, but I just, so there were steps on a mezzanine, I just shot down those steps. Uh, you know, I thought, all the people screaming, Zahi, Zahi, it's Diane Firmino. <laughs> and somehow, Somehow he heard me, and he, he turned around and he said, what are you doing in Cairo? And I said, well, I'm with D. <laughs> and so come with me. So we went back up to the mezzanine, and they greeted each other warmly and re remarked the uh, amazing uh, how that happened. Uh, and then afterwards, D looked at me and she said, it, she had no idea what happened with me because I just shot out there. I didn't say, oh, there's somebody down there i got to find catch or something and we laughed for years because she really thought I'd gone mad <laughs> you know I didn't say anything it was just look <laughs> so that was a, a really fun experience uh, as well thanks to Dee when I was there on that in Cairo because her husband had been a diplomat uh, we were invited to tea at Mrs. Sadat's home in Cairo and you can see, and this is uh, me in, in, in her home, and you can see the painting, of course, of Anwar, of her husband, uh, behind her. And, uh, and it was Sudi that she asked Mrs. Sadat to speak at the college. And I believe she had been in Reno. She'd spoken at UNR, I think, also in the past. But uh, she came, and um, uh, we were so very fortunate to have her. And she was a lovely lady. And uh, um, of course, I would have loved to have her at the home, but my home, but you just couldn't. I mean, she's former first lady of Egypt, right? And probably uh, most of you, or many of you, are aware that she passed in 2021. And there was a huge military funeral for her in Cairo. And she is known in Egypt as the mother of heroes. Yeah, yeah. So, but that would not have happened. Uh, without D. It's all because of D who passed a few years ago. And I will always um, hold her deep in my heart for being such a wonderful person and making this possible. And Pam, my friend in the front row, we visited her grave some years ago in Oklahoma, so she is buried there. And, um, and uh, upon her passing, she established uh, the Seas for Peace and Understanding Endowment. Uh, for the series, and uh, uh, because of that, we're able to bring uh, s speakers of quality to our college. So forever, I'll be indebted to her. The next uh, uh, speaker we hosted, I is, uh, wanted to include for sure because of my connection with Ethiopia, and this is Dr. Donald Johansson. In case anybody can't read that large font, uh, uh, who is uh, credited with finding our hominid, 3.2 million hominid ancestor Lucy in the desert of Ethiopia in 1974. In 2008, if I have this correctly, uh, they brought Lucy to this country, but only a few museums would uh, accept 
have her on exhibit because of the liability. One of them was the Pacific Science Center in uh, Seattle. So of course I had to go and I met Effie, you know, coming from Missoula uh, for that exhibit. And um, when we walked in, there was a big video with, uh, you know, about Dr. Johansson and I thought, I have to try to get Dr. Johansson. I um, mean, this is, uh, this is, uh, no, I have to try that. So came back here for the exhibit and it took me a long time, some months. I didn't know how to write him. I mean, he is the director of, uh, Department of Human Origins, I believe it, he was at, uh, Arizona State. So I got the address, finally composed a letter and told him about my parents' work and that I felt Ethiopia is my spiritual home. Will you come to our college? And I'm not knowing if he would answer or when that might might be. It was within a matter of days, and I got a lovely email, and he said, but of course. <laughs> so he was here. It was a wonderful presentation, and this is the uh, cover of his book. And I would like to pose a question now. And uh, uh, how many of you know the or why uh, our ancestor, why is she called Lucy? How many people know the answer? I, uh, yes, all right. H how many people? One. One? <laughs> one, there's one. I know that uh, somebody told me they know, yes, somebody told me yesterday. J know, anybody wanna guess? All right, now this is the answer. Uh, when Dr. Johansson was a graduate student in 74 out in the desert, and uh, he knew, he and the team knew they'd found something important, you know, it's, um, they, that's their work, right? And you just see a little tiny bit. So they went back to camp that night, and they were all excited, and uh, who was on the uh, BBC or the radio? The Beatles. So that's why she's called Lucy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Ethiopia, she has a different name in the language, Nikanish, which means like uh, the wonderful one. But everybody knows her as, as Lucy. So who won? Who knew the answer? Cecilia. Cecilia, of course Cecilia did. I was going to say maybe admissions would give you a discount for class, but you already teach here, <laughs> right? Okay, all right. <laughs> good, good. So uh, that was very special. It gave me the opportunity to uh, dedicate that evening to my parents' work, which was very wonderful. I was made me very, very happy. And the last speaker I'd like to bring to you this evening uh, is uh, Fred Kaufman, who is still the executive producer of the series Nature on PBS. And uh, so this involves Effie once again. As I said, we'd like to get together every year or two. And she had invited me to Missoula. Uh, let me get the year. Let's see. Uh, the year. I don't have 2013. Uh, for uh, they have an uh, annual or biannual, say biannual um, wildlife film festival, the Missoula International Wildlife. And so I wanted to visit her and go to the festival, the film festival. And we, you go around to little theaters to see the um, different films. And um, there was talking once again. You know, you got to always listen to what people are talking about. And they said Fred Kaufman was attending the film festival and also would be receiving a lifetime achievement award for his work. So I thought. Wow, I wonder how I can, how could I possibly meet Fred Kaufman? Then I found out there was going to be a very fancy barbecue at a beautiful ranch at the base of the Northern Rockies. Um, and I thought, hmm, you know, I'm a French teacher. How am I going to get in that barbecue? And the answer, of course, is no. money. <laughs> so for, I think it was $25. <laughs> I could do it, you know. Uh, uh, and so I wanted to uh, um, invite Effie also. So I said, Effie, we're going to this barbecue at this ranch. Um, come on. So we got on. They had an old school bus, yellow school bus. And we got to this beautiful ranch. And 
people milling around, and I thought, now what do I do? So I was at the chip bar uh, salsa and chips table and talking to young filmmaker. There were uh, people from you know very noted film people to beginning you know doing uh, documentaries and such, and I just started saying, I'm a French teacher from Reno, but, and do you have any idea how I might meet Fred Kaufman? And he said, well, I might know somebody who might know somebody. So follow me, so, no, uh, of, of course. Yes, so I we went off and he went straight up to the MC of the film festival and he said, this young lady, and I said, that's me, uh, would like to meet uh, Mr. Kaufman. And so we walked off, and there I was right in front of him. So I just said, would you like to speak in my college? And he said, of course. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, I'm doing a, a little bit of creative license here. <laughs> something to that effect. And so true to his word, he was lovely. He flew from New York, the main offices are in New York City, and uh, flew out, was with us two or three days, and I have a colleague here, Jerry Franson. Are they still there? Where's Jerry? Uh, he was on, there you are, okay. And uh, we wanted to show Fred around a bit. So didn't we go out to Pyramid, Jerry? And we did, and um, uh, Fred really, we had a tour of the museum there, right? The museum, and then Fred really enjoyed, I thought, well, are they the pelicans that are there? You know, to see the wildlife, but he enjoyed that, but really he enjoyed talking with the elders there, I believe. And uh, we had a lovely time. Is there anything you want to add, Jerry, to that visit? No, yes. <laughs> I was hoping you'd take over, no. All right, uh, so, and then uh, driving back in the Jeep, Jerry's Jeep, I think, laughing and telling stories, and he told the story how, you know, I came up to him, and he did say he had a few drinks at the barbecue, but he said I came up, and he thought, oh, this is some big agent, and I'm going to get a gig in Reno. <laughs> so that's why I said, of course. And so to this day, this is the poster he always, he wrote to me, to my agent, Diane. <laughs> so if I ever communicate at Christmas or something, I always sign it from your agent. And every once in a while I wonder, hmm, I wonder if he still needs an agent. <laughs> that was lovely. And then we had a, a reception for him. Uh, so that was 20, 2013. And uh, he continues as uh, executive producer, so when you're watching Nature, you'll s just look on the list of, you know, credits, and you'll see Fred, so lovely, lovely man. Um, <clears throat> uh, now, I, uh, we've talked a bit about the past, so I'd like to say a few words about what's coming up next year. So TMCC is uh, having a year of sustainability, focusing on sustainability, um, and um, so um, I, uh, we already have uh, two speakers lined up. The first one is a uh, noted wildlife photographer named Christy Odom. She's one of about 50 Nikon ambassadors in the country and uh, a photographer, but an environmentalist. And the uh, reason that came up is that during the pandemic, you know, like a, a lot of us uh, watching Zooms and learn, taking classes, and I took some a photography Zoom uh, she was giving, and she just had this wonderful energy. And so, what did I do? I said, would you like to speak at my college? She had a wonderful energy. But she takes, uh, you know, small groups uh, to South America and, and Africa, and she uh, had been to Uganda before and really loved it, was taking, doing another trip. And I said, oh, I'd love to go. I'd never been to Uganda and any chance to go to Africa, but it was postponed twice. So I actually just went with her small group this October. So it was wonderful, and uh, so um, we've already, she'll be here in April, so we'll be in touch. 
and she'll do a wonderful presentation, uh, photography with purpose, in other words, the environment and such. So I thought I would add a few uh, shots because I was her student, and so these are a few of my shots from this in October, yeah. So this fellow just right in front of our Jeep, and then the gorillas. You know, I did the trekking. I might have warned you it was wonderful, but it just about did me in, but I did it. I went to the rhino sanctuary. And just, this is the, you hear about the impenetrable forest, so it, this is a, shows you what it is. So beautiful, but somebody said the other day, well, you penetrated it, so is it impenetrable? So I don't know if it's impenetrable or penetrable. Beautiful, beautiful, so beautiful, very lush. And we were in the rainy season too, you know, it's not quite like this in the dry season. And this uh, juvenile gorilla. And then you, we all know the gorillas in the mist film, right? It is like that. And this I couldn't resist. So I did. <laughs> I don't know if they might want to open an office here. <laughs> anyway, I snuck away when we were stopping to get gas because I didn't want to offend anybody, and, but I, I grabbed this shot for fun. And this is uh, Christy, and uh, she'll be here April 13th, so mark it down. <laughs> yeah, and then this is, these are a couple she took. I, I think the warthogs look great. <laughs> Uh, uh, anyway, I really like those warthogs. And this is her work, you see. So it'll be a beautiful presentation. And she's so much into s citizen science and um, the environment. And then uh, this uh, uh, young woman I met at my university celebration in Paris. We were all having a good time, of course. And where are you from and what brings you to Paris? And um, she had also graduated. She's a little bit younger than I am, but um, uh, from the university with uh, uh, some years ago. And uh, she's Filipino American, but she's a sustainability uh, fashion journalist. And I said, "Would you like to speak?" She has an office in San Francisco, so she has accepted. We haven't set the date, but probably next September, October. And she was lovely. So Ruby. Uh, um, and she's, uh, you know, an advocate for uh, women and the labor situation around the world. Lovely person. So that, uh, oh, now we have the conclusion. So uh, I, I added the thinker here. That's me trying to think of a conclusion. <laughs> Let's see, what did, I, what did I write down here? So I want to thank you. These are... Um, some of my ex my experiences, uh, my wonderful parents, opportunities I've <clears throat> that opened up to me for study, for travel, and to meet people from around the world. I'm I'm I, uh, <clears throat> so very grateful for that in my life, uh, and that I feel they've all led me to be here this evening with you, and. I um, um, I just hope, it's been my joy if I've been able to bring a, a sliver, a slice, or a fraction of the diversity uh, available to us on our planet, home to Reno. It's been my joy. So I want to thank you. Oh. oh. Thank you. It's not over. Uganda. <laughs> Don't get me started.
I couldn't res resist these giraffe guys. And uh, a, a Dean here, wonderful a Dean, um, she's a linguist herself, and she said, let's, 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 let's do the French thing, right? Avez-vous des questions? But uh, I don't know if anybody has a question. I can pass the mic to anyone that has a question for Diane. No secrets. What's Don't tell me secrets. <laughs> What's next on your travel plans? Oh, my goodness. Well, um, uh, it took me three weeks to recover from that. So, uh, But it turns out Effie that I've talked about is so, uh, so wonderful, like family for me. And I had been to Morocco before. I loved it. And she and her family are uh, going uh, in December. And she asked me about six months ago if I would like to, you know, join them. And she's like family, and I loved Morocco. And so I, I said, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, I'm leaving uh, on Sunday. So I have to pack right after the reception. <laughs> so I am, and uh, uh, but I'll fly and spend two nights in Marseille, do the practice my French, and then we're going to have four days in, uh, after that, and stopping in Senegal. And so I'm, I have two friends here tonight that we're going to meet in uh, Senegal. I've heard it's a uh, very neat uh, an art center. So then I'll be back, and then I'm here for, for a long while. Unless something comes up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's okay. I've had quiet students before. <laughs> I was hoping that, do I have any students here tonight, former students? I'm a former student. Who's that? Right here, with the microphone. Oh, yes. It's, it's Dorothy, right? Yes. Oh, oh my goodness. Oh, Dorothy. <laughs> oh. Yeah. And, and I have to tell you, you know, your, your Spain, New Mexico class, I just, it's like, I just don't even forget any of it. It was just so fabulous. And I wondered, at that time, I think you'd done the pilgrimage in pieces. Um, but I, I don't remember if you had done it all the way. And I was wondering. If I'd done all, what all the way? The, the pilgrimage. The, for the, oh, the, for the Camino Santiago. de Santiago? Yes. Okay. Uh, Dorothy. <laughs> I, you know, I remember so many details that you took. Oh, yeah, you took by Spain to New Mexico, I, right? I did, and we went to Luis. Oh, okay, okay. And, uh, <laughs> confession. Et cetera, but. Okay. I became interested in the Camino, this one reason when I went on that project, and um, I did the research, and we talk about it in the class, you know, the history, St. James, the bones, all of that. Uh, and I've been to the cathedral. I've seen the Botafumero, which is, you know, the largest, I always forget that word, uh, a sensor that holds ashes in the world. And I've been to several of the cities. I haven't actually walked it. And um, uh, I blame it on my toes. But anyway, uh, but I, I know this, the legend behind it. I still have a magnet on my refrigerator that's a little tile. Oh, that I gave this. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I, just, I just wanted you to know, I'm glad, glad you have a question and answer. I'm just like completely moved and emotional to hear you tonight and to hear all of the fabulous things you've done and just, um, just to tell you that oh. the knowledge you put in my brain I, I still have conversations. It, that class was so interesting. Oh. It was fabulous. I still often question, you know, the whole Spanish Inquisition and how, how all of the people, uh, the fascinating um, oh. genealogy of the people in New Mexico that you brought up at the time. And, and uh, it really, but spiritually and academically, just has, has just been a tremendous fountain of knowledge that, that you just shared with us. You probably were the most enjoyable class I've ever had, oh. ever. <laughs> <laughs> and, and thank you. And, and I'm so happy to see you so I saw active you. and still doing everything. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> 
Dorothy, when I saw your name, of course I checked the RSVP oh. list. Uh, <laughs> just saw, you know, um, data. Uh, so I saw your name because I haven't seen you in so long. I just saw, oh, you're going to be here tonight. I just feel so honored, Dorothy. Uh, Zebras? Well, uh, uh, yeah, I did go in 2009 to work with uh, Gravy Zebras in Kenya. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, yeah. I have to, you have to do. I had to do it. Oh, Dorothy, oh, I need a drink. <laughs> Oh. Excuse me, I keep bumping into this. Yeah. Oh. oh, oh my goodness, my goodness. I think uh, we should end right there. Anyway, uh, just a minute. Uh, it's, it's, wait, I'll turn the page. Oh, it's blank. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have uh, one more question for Diane? All right. Oh, yes. Oh. Um, I was just wondering when you were exhausted from hiking, when you were taking all of your pictures, when you were experiencing these incredible creatures, what was it that your body was telling you, your spirit, your soul, what were you feeling? What was I feeling? I feel like I'm on CNN or something. <laughs> uh, what, was I, what was my body telling me? Uh, we better get there soon. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. You know, I'd been warned. You know, maybe if you've maybe there's some of the audience has done the uh, grill or chimp trekking. Uh, it's it's uh, quite something, and you don't know how long you'll be out there because they're in families, right? And they sc send a scout out to uh, radio back. They've seen a, a group or a family, so you could be out. An hour, you could be out six or seven hours. So uh, it's kind of like, are we there yet? But uh, but uh, I don't know. I think it's um, uh, the I don't know if I say drive. You know, you have. I was there for that reason. I wanted to do it, and I'm going to do it. So I just said, oh please, universe, let, not let me poop out <laughs> before I get there. So uh, yeah, I think when you really have something inside you that 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 takes you right that takes you so um uh and then all of a sudden there you are and i've been thinking more about because i'm interested in travel as, as pilgrimage you know preparation and physical challenges and i thought that was kind of like a pilgrimage because you prepare for it you think about it why am i doing it and then involves physical challenges, and then all of a sudden you're in the final glory, whether that's a cathedral or, you know, a gorilla family. So I think it just kept me going. And uh, but I tell you, when you get back, it's uh, uh, you can't move. You know, they fortunately they have like a housekeeper in the lodges because uh, you come back filthy. It's rainy season, so you know your boots and all that, and they wash everything and put you in bed and everything. So uh, there's a, that reward too. But I think there's just something inside. I'm thankful for that, that, you know, well, I can do it. I can get there. So, but then you have the final glory that you, you feel good that you did that. So that's a wonderful thing too, I th uh, to experience. It's a, it's a wonderful feeling. I'm sure many of you have had experiences like that, that were not easy. But um, you're so grateful. I think they change you. Yeah, I think so, really. And I, I see my friend in the back, my aunt, that we were in uh, Spain together, and we took a wonderful tour. I think it was of the uh, Alhambra. And did he say, my aunt, that, you know, it, it was about art, I think, but it was that it changes your uh, microbes? No, what was it? What did he say? You don't remember? Changes almost your biology, yeah. So I think spiritually and that way as well. So I just I feel um, uh, 
Yeah, I think a try to um, travel can change us. I think so internally. Yeah, I think that's a wonderful value of travel. To come back at, at different in whatever way that is. Yeah, so. Who's the who's the new person? Yeah. <laughs> oh. Okay. Hi. Well, I know you're trying to end, so I'll make this short. But that last question got me thinking about something. You know how it is when chimps are were those gorillas that were looking at you? Those photos. You know they have those big eyes and they just are looking straight at you. And I feel as if maybe they're asking this question, <laughs> and I want to find out what you think about it. Are they asking us, can you as humans somehow get your act together <laughs> and become more enlightened? You know, are you capable as humans to become better, a better species, just better in some way? So that's, I'm just, I've always wondered when I look at those eyes, when they're looking at us sort of trustingly or something. And sometimes dogs look at us that way, right? So our, what do you think? Do you think we're capable as humans to become better? I think I'd like to open that to the audience. <laughs> uh, there's so much we don't, so much we don't know about animals, right? And I always remember Fred Kaufman, and I just, sorry, Curtin, is she who was with me when Fred was here? He's the director of uh, uh, KUNR, right, the, uh, the PBS, right, and uh, Fred, he interviewed Fred, and I always remember Fred saying, we know we're just beginning to learn about animals. And we see all the time these programs and uh, learning so much, so, uh, I don't know their form of questioning that, what it might be, but we do share such a, what, 90, I've forgotten now, 98.4 of our DNA and such, and I, I feel they're sentient beings. And uh, so um, I leave that open to possibility. Would anybody like to say anything about, on that subject? I felt honored to be in their world, or their, near their world, you know, within about 10 feet, um, near their, in their habitat, in their world. So I felt honored to be allowed to be near their world. So I don't know exactly how they felt about our looking, you know, being close to their, to their world. I don't know, do we have any um, zoologists here, or anyone would like to comment on that? Okay, I'm so, so I'm, al I'm not alone in not having a, <laughs> a complete answer. Or, oh, we've got you someone. Know, Diane, yes. we've talked about this, but um, the intelligence, thanks to Fred, of uh, being able to witness the intelligence of octopi, yes. all of these thinkings, these procedures, uh, their capabilities, um, we need to respect them as we respect ourselves. And, and preserve their habitat and, and really learn from them, carefully observing them, what you have done, because we learn everything from observation. And so uh, to get back to, I just feel that I don't know how we became or came to believe that we were at the top uh, of, of this strata system or if there, is an ev if there is a strata system, but just to actually look, you look at this and you see this sensitivity and this, uh, the the love of their family and their offspring are, mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I don't know how we decided that we were the top. Well, that's probably a, well, anyway. a question for yeah. historians yeah, and uh, religion and different things, right? Um, that's a good good point. Yeah, and that's why I felt honored to just be for exposed briefly to that world. So it helped me, I think, hope change. You know, I'm, I'm in their world, you know, just to have a little glimpse of that. So open mind, open our minds to that. Just anybody, um, Louie, you look pensive. 
Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe, uh, yeah. <laughs> I know, I, I'm glad I got that shot. Yeah, <laughs> it was fun. Um, yeah, I just saw what this last week, uh, a, uh, I think it was a chimp, I can't remember, a zoo, and then they had to do a C-section for her to have her baby, and they, the baby was, had, uh, the oxygen was low, and when the baby was better, the, when the mother saw the baby, it was so touching. Maybe did some of you see that on the news? It was very touching. So, yeah, I think we have a, a lot to learn, and uh, but that's a complex question about all, I don't know, Oh, that strata, yeah. Anybody else like to? These questions are wonderful. So, um, anything else? Well, um, what? Okay, well, we have something special for you coming up. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Mm. Oh. <laughs> oh. If you'd like to have a seat. Okay. Wait, I, then I, I you said I have. Yes, sit down. All right. Thank you, Diane. That was just amazing. And your experiences and your tenaciousness and your ability to have people never say no to you is amazing. <laughs> and so we've benefited so greatly at the college for all these years. The speakers that you've brought have provided insight and knowledge and wonderful experiences for our students. And so with that, the college is just so honored to name the Distinguished Speaker Series, the Diane Dodd Chesseldine Distinguished Speaker Series. Say that 10 times fast. <laughs> beautiful piece of art entitled Sunshine that Candace Garlock, our visual arts professor, selected specifically for you. And I'd like to read what it says. I have to find that. And the note here says, what if I fall? Oh, but my darling, what if you fly? <laughs> so that's very fitting for you. <laughs> so this is for you. Do you want to come up and accept it? Well, I'm not quite done, Diane. I know you're. <laughs> so you all see this beautiful light we have here for Diane that now has the official naming for you. So we're so excited about that. And also, I want to note that we have a scholarship endowment in Diane's name as well that has been established. So we invite all of you to contribute to her endowment. There's a QR code on your program, and we also have a donation box over there if you'd like to make a contribution. And with an endowment, as with Dee Gamal's endowment for the series, that will it will provide scholarships for students in perpetuity in Diane's name. So we're very honored to have that. <laughs> 